Ah! Hey everybody, welcome to The Recoup. I'm Cooper Daniels and I'm a guy that knows a little about a lot. And today we continue with the crypto series, but we're doing an interview. That's right, folks. I told you I was going to do more interviews and here I am. Look at this. I'm doing what I said. And we've got Brian Haney from ChoiceCoin on today. Brian is an interesting dude. You may know him as Green Rex on Discord and other places. ChoiceCoin is a really compelling project and I wanted to get him on. You know, ChoiceCoin is basically, you know, trying to decentralize voting, right? Him and his partner Archie Chowdhury got together earlier this year and they're like, hey man, you want to go win the MIT Bitcoin Hackathon? And then Archie was like, yeah, bro, that sounds cool. And so they went over there and just won the whole thing under the name Algorand Autonomous and then got a Algorand Foundation grant. And then they created ChoiceCoin, um, you know, a few months ago. They also got tasked by the Algorand Foundation to build AI that can predict the volatility in algo price action. Look, we talk all about it. And then we also talk about regulation. Can algo be considered a security? He's got a law background. We talk about all this stuff, folks. I hope you enjoy this talk with Brian Haney from ChoiceCoin. Let's get into it. What's up, everybody? So we're here with Brian Haney from Fortier Blockchain, ChoiceCoin. How you doing, Brian? I'm great. Thanks, Coop. Yeah, man. Thank you for joining us or joining me, I guess. Thanks I keep on referring me. to it. Yeah, of course. I keep referring to this as us, but it's it's really just me and my plants, man. Um, the royal so, we. The royal we. Yeah, it's annoying, I think. Anyways, uh, so uh, yeah, man. Um, I was on, you know, you're on Discord, you're Green Rex on Discord, and I saw a lot of your posts and it was like, you're talking about choice coin. You're talking, I mean, you write these papers. You're clearly a very educated dude. I mean, from what I've seen, your law degree from Notre Dame, you did a fellowship at Stanford. Um, I know I was just really impressed. And so I wanted to get you on, talk about choice coin, talk about four tier blockchain, talk about you. Just want to start with uh, maybe introducing everybody to you and, you know, your kind of history. Yeah. Thanks. I, uh, so I guess I'll sort of talk about my my journey into the blockchain into cryptocurrency. So I first heard about blockchain probably in 2015 when I was uh, finishing up school. Um, I first started buying crypto on Coinbase probably in 2018. Started doing more academic research into uh, different blockchain networks that were out there. Um, and then I uh, entered practice. So I was a lawyer. And probably the first like real professional exposure I had to blockchain was working on a, a case. Uh, it was really interesting. A hospital got hit with ransomware for uh, Bitcoin. And I got to work on the security and recovery and compliance response to that incident. And that was probably my favorite uh, case that I worked on as a lawyer. Um, no longer practicing. So I left practice up in 2000 to pursue a, a academia and did the fellowship. Um, and sort of towards the end of that, uh, I was pretty broke and I needed to find a way to make some money. So uh, <laughs> I saw that the uh, MIT Bitcoin Club had an open hackathon in April nice. of this year and they were offering uh, prizes. And I was like, okay, like I'll take a shot at it. So I got into the Discord and uh, this uh, little, uh, it looked like a goblin, was Darcidius from Star Wars, asked if anybody right. wanted to make a team in the MIT hackathon on Discord. And I was like, yeah, I figured my odds of making some money were better if I had a team. And the teammate, the person that I ended up uh, teaming up with was Archie Shad Hurry. And mm -hmm. we worked pretty hard over the course of the hackathon. It was like a weekend long thing. It was like 40 hours, I think. And we ended up winning. So it was like 500 people. <laughs> we, we really didn't expect that, but we, we ended up being the top prize winner for our project, which was called Algorand Autonomous, which right. was essentially a, a DAO. And um, working with Archie was re really incredible. And we were really amazed at what we were able to accomplish together um, to win that hackathon. And then after the hackathon, we applied for, for an Algo grant and uh, we were fortunate enough to get it. We're really grateful for the opportunity. Um, so we're, we're building uh, different applications for artificial intelligence on the Algorand blockchain now. And um, as part of that, we saw an opportunity to create an asset and choice coin, and we've been developing mm -hmm. that as well. Yeah, I saw. Um, so I saw with the with the grant, it's your so obviously the decentralized governance and the voting. And then also you guys are working on AI uh, to kind of predict volatility in the like for algo. Is that is that right? Yeah, so the grant has three parts. The first part was 
called AlgoGenius smart contracts. So when you look at the smart contracts on the Algorand blockchain, there's traditionally stateful and stateless smart contracts, which are really just different types of logical executions that you're, you're running on the blockchain. We wanted to create a mechanism by which you could formalize the contract process in a traditional sense, right? So like if you're a contract, you're a business, you got another business, you sign a deal, right? Like that has yeah. the terms of the deal and you sign it and you've got that memorandum that signifies that legal binding agreement. We wanted to create a way that that could happen on the blockchain. So that was the first thing that we did. And then the second was uh, decentralized voting. So we created a, a way for people to be able to vote um, on the algorithm blockchain, which is really great because it it's secure and it's open and transparent. And that was when we saw the opportunity to, to build the choice coin asset to facilitate that. And right. now we're working on the third phase of our grant, which is predicting the price of algo using artificial intelligence technologies cool so is that i mean what's your predict do you have a prediction for us i mean <laughs> is your is your is your technology working like what's let's yeah like, i mean yeah so what's the uh where are we at <laughs> um yeah so right now it's operating at 95 percent accuracy rate which is exciting uh wow and it looks good so yeah, we're really excited about it. We're going to make everything open once we, we publish the paper and, and, and file the patent application. Um, yeah. But we are really optimistic about the future for Algorand, and especially yeah. with, I mean, it, it just sort of like, I'm thinking about it from like a business perspective, like once Tiny Man launches, like there's going to be an enormous amount of value added to the Algorand network that is going to allow it to scale. And really yeah, which is coming, I think it's like, it's in, any day or now, right? Is yeah, that, yeah. Right? It's, <laughs> so, wait, it's so it's good to but that'll be i mean that's the end of this month we're hoping but yeah we're really yeah, excited about that. that's awesome man okay so let's let's dive in a little bit more into four tier blockchain what is four tier blockchain how long has that been around and and what what's the relationship between four tier blockchain and choice coin and yeah how does that look at yeah so four tier blockchain is american small business we're uh, a partnership in wyoming and We've been around. I think I think we were filed in in July. I think is when we filed our our articles of incorporation, and that's just so you guys are this brand new. Yeah, yeah, we're a brand new startup. It's just uh, really it's just me and Archie, right? We were two partners, um, mm. and we created that as, as a company legal entity, essentially just to want to protect our liability for like operating in a DAO, but then also because we wanted to have equity and then have a, a place to hold the intellectual property developed. So most of what we're doing with Choice Coin is. Oh, open source for the most part everything we're doing with choice coin is open source but sometimes we have to delay release just for security purposes right but having a way to hold the intellectual property so like even when you're open sourcing stuff you still have copyrights you still have patents you still have things that you're doing to solidify the innovation that's happening um and then releasing it to people under a license so for us it's the apache license so to get to your question, so four-tier blockchain is, is, is a company that we started. ChoiceCoin is a decentralized autonomous organization operating um, and advancing the, the asset choice. Right. And so ChoiceCoin, so, okay. So ChoiceCoin is basically aims to, you know, de, you know, decentralized voting, right? That's the main how does it i mean let's just talk about how that works and what the what creates value for choice coin like what's the what's behind choice coin here yeah so i mean that's really what we're trying to do right we're trying to create and then capture value and i think that's one of the great things about blockchain technology is they allow small businesses startups to, to capture a high percentage mm -hmm. of the value they create through digital assets choice coin itself is, is a really great asset and a lot in large part because of the fact that it's built on the algorithm blockchain so it's able to take in all of those security features that are already existing on the algorithm blockchain like post quantum security and we added additional security features as well right so like as election voting sort of like progresses through time like you're going to have more and more advanced attacks whether that's coming from you know artificial intelligence or, or quantum right. computers or next generation hardware um, but we really wanted to maintain the edge and be the company that is both capturing and advancing the edge and innovation in voting security. And that's what we're doing. And finding a way to create that uh, across a decentralized ledger, I think, is a really great thing, too, because it's open and transparent and it reduces opportunity for fraud. So right. 
we're creating a better voting system and the algorithm blockchain is, is why we're able to do that. So is the idea can, can are, are you guys thinking that choice coin can scale to handle along with Algorand like a U.S. election? Is that as big? Can it be something that big? I mean, obviously, that's far out. But is it is that something that is even possible, I, I guess? Yeah. So, I mean, the way that we we really believe this, but when you're a startup, you want to focus on getting a, a big share of a small market to start. Right. So as we build out this application, we're going to need to tailor that specifically to niche markets, whether that's state right. elections or local elections or you know, corporate governance decisions or wherever the demand is, we need to develop our technology more so that we can really uh, develop a customer base for it. With that right. said, I think we do have the infrastructure in place to be able to scale it. So we have designed a system that will able allow people essentially to take, you know, one choice and then turn that into however many choices they need for that particular voting application. So you'll, when you do these elections, do you, so are you going to, in order to vote, you spend a choice? Is that, so each vote's going to cost a choice coin? Yeah, that's essentially what the way we're going to do it. So like, let's say you're a government and you want to be able to allow a population to vote via, uh, via choice, then you can, but we work with them to be able to create a unique choice derivative on the algorithm blockchain for that particular election so like if it's the 2024 you know presidential election you might have like you know choice coin 2024 presidential election we'll create that asset we'll verify it and then we'll allow that to be the uh the asset that's used by every individual to vote and that would help to again reduce reduce fraud and improve the security of the system overall right and so does um Okay, so obviously we're entering into a decentralized governance model at Algorand. And does how does choice coin does choice coin play into this at all, or is may it play into it in the future, or um, is there any kind of is there any relationship to the decentralized governance that we're about to do in choice coin, or a plan for that? Yeah, so I mean, part of the whole purpose of choice coin was to solve that decentralized governance problem, to create opportunity to attract people to the Algorand network and to retain people on. On the Algorand network, um, we're not particularly involved in the governance for Algorand right now. I mean, we're happy to do that and to advance yeah. our partnership with them. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. Algorand people who work at Algorand are absolutely incredible, and um, yeah. we're obviously partnered with them and the foundation, and uh, really appreciative of any opportunity to to advance that. Right, and so okay, so I'm I'm trying to understand um, because like in Algorand, you know, with the with the model that they have, it's going to be one algo, one vote, right? That's kind of the model for that. And so I'm imagining that obviously choice coin doesn't work like that. It, it, or am I wrong? It, I would think that it would be different because that's, you know, that's obviously for elections that wouldn't work, you know, and like, so um, what, how, how does that, how does the voting, how, if, maybe you already covered it, but just maybe you can clear that up again. Yeah. So it's a generalizable voting system, right? Like we're still super early in the development on this. And our, right. what we've created is a system that's scalable to meet the need of individual customers to meet demand of the market. So like right. obviously a number of different ways in which people can vote just in the traditional sense, but also on the blockchain, there's there's even more. So we want to be able to, to meet whatever the demand of the market is and to be able to customize the voting solution to the particular people. So that's that's essentially like what we've created with uh, the four tier voting protocol, which is the way that people vote using choice coin. Got it. Got it. OK, so how does choice coin, um, you know, for lack of a better way of asking this, how does it go up in value? Like, how does this how does the actual asset become more valuable? Because it would seem to me if like a government needed to use choice coin, that it would need to be at a for a vote, it would need to be at a very low cost, correct? Or you're, what you're saying, and maybe I'm being a bit dense here and I apologize. So what you're saying is that you guys can work with certain entities to create a system within your um, ecosystem that will, you could use like less choice coin. I, I'm, I'm- Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> it's an easy answer though, right? Like, so- yeah. It's the same as all digital assets. They're driven by demand, right? The market is, is driven right. by demand. That's what causes the price for something to go up. We create a digital right. asset, and as demand for that asset increases, the price of the asset would, would increase as well. Right now, right. we don't have a price on it, right? So 
we're waiting right. for 90 million. We, we found a way to build technology to sell it directly ourselves, but we decided not to do that. Um, you know, right. Compliance and ethics are super important to us. So we're, we're staying away from things that are, that are gray and we're doing it the right way. Once it has a value, then it will be demand driven. And that's going to be on us to build the technology and to ensure that the infrastructure is there to support the value of the asset. In terms of how do you create value, I think we're going to follow the same model that Algorand put in place, right? They have substantive research, intellectual property, massive software stacks, you know, across the, the entire world that yeah. <laughs> to support the value of that asset, right? It's not just like this is uh, smoke and mirrors or magic. It's, it's um, people the best people in the world working incredibly hard to create technology that has value to people. And, and that's what we're going to do too, right? We have the research, the patents, the intellectual property, this open software licenses um, to, to add value and to capture value for the network. Right. So if there is a choice coin local election, let's say I'm, I'm, there's a, the, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. Where are you at? Uh, Washington. You're in Washington. Oh yeah. You're in Seattle, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's say there's a local election in Los Angeles and it's one of those, you know, lesser huge, you know, it's one of those ones that people don't really pay attention to. They're under, um, there's not a lot of people that actually know about it, but maybe they would if it were easily done from their home and they didn't have to actually go somewhere or, you know, whatever they, and this, the LA decided to team up with Algorand and choice coin and have you guys do this. And so you guys would set up a, you would set something up in a, in in, um, in association or whatever with Los Angeles County, and there would be an election, and we would vote like normal, and um, on our phones or our computers, right? And we would need each citizen would need to own a choice coin. Is that how that would work? And then we would we would spend a choice coin for our vote. Yeah. So the way that that would work, we probably want to first integrate with their existing architectures you probably want to let people have the option right like they can have a tradition like you can go in person or you can vote with this right um, they wouldn't be voting with the actual choice coin itself right they would be voting with um an asset dedicated to the election for la county so it would be like we call it like choice la 2021 or whenever the election was and we would create that asset and then that right. asset would be owned by the county and they would distribute that asset to people who wish to vote using this new mechanism. And then that would create a scalable, secure way for people to vote from the comfort of their home. And that would add value to them. Uh, it would allow people to, more people to be able to vote, to access the voting system. I mean, it's, especially with like an aging population, like it's not always easy to like, or if you're like you're working or whatever, like it's not always easy yeah. to go out to the ballot box and allowing right. people to vote from the comfort of their phones by sending a choice um, and to be able to record that in a scalable way, I, I think is something we're really excited about. So, okay. So now I think I understand. And so you, and how does choice, so if you're going to create like an LA County token or whatever for this voting, which seems like a great idea. And so where does, so what is choice, what is choice coin to that? Is there anything or is it just choice coin is, yeah. How does choice coin play into that? Yeah. So, I mean, choice coin is, I guess we say this like the native asset of the network, right? Like it's the right. foundational thing, and we still need to figure that out. That's something that we're we're thinking through. But generally, Got we're it. thinking it might be a situation where we use that choice, like a choice coin, to represent the creation of the specific asset for LA County, right? So, like maybe we say LA County buys, you know, a thousand choice, and then we take those a thousand choice and we use that to represent the you know, 10,000 or a million or whatever they need to facilitate that. Got it. There we go. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Cool. Um, see, I, sometimes I get around to figuring things out. Like <laughs> That's um, I have a time explaining it. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. I mean, look, this, we're, I'm figuring this out too. You know, this is all new to me. So anyways, so, um, all right, man, I like that. Uh, if we were going live and we had, um, people asking questions over on the right side over here. I think we'd probably have about 12 people asking like when yield. Yield is a great project, right? I think Yieldly and Smilecoin similarly, right? Like they started on Ethereum and moved over to Agra and they have the advantage of, of being able to, to be on Uniswap to begin to have that sort of uh, initial price. And we're going, we've been on Agra from the start. So we're waiting for Tiny Man. That'll be our opportunity to right. create our value. 
Um, and then right. we're applying to other exchanges as well to, to sell the asset um, and right. to drive value there. We want to keep it as efficient as possible. And, you know, we're not trying to attract investors, right? Like Toyscoin is an investment, it's a utility token. It's something that people are going to be able to use. And just like any other asset, like your car, or your house, that value of that asset will change. It'll go up and down depending on demand in the market. Um, right. I'm not really familiar with uh, the details of like staking on Yuli. Um, I bought some, I thought like, you know, this is a great project. I, I wanna see Algorand projects succeed and other Algorand projects succeed. And I think what they're doing is great. Like their software is amazing. Um, yeah. And if there's opportunities for us to work with them in the future, I'd be really excited about that. Cool. This, it, it just seems like this is where voting needs to go, right? The blockchain quant and you guys are quantum safe and, and and obviously what Algorand is doing and it's just it seems like this is I feel like we're in the right place and you guys are in the right ecosystem for all of this. So, I mean, I'm excited about it. Um, I am, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's cool. And then Tiny Man's coming. So you're going to be able to, you know, people are going to be able to probably, you know, get in on choice coin, you know. Over there, I think so. Yeah. So yeah. Like we're, we've. Uh... So Archie, my partner, brilliant, brilliant developer. And um, he, I mean, he figured it out in like five minutes. He's just like, he's like, hey, I got, yeah. it, I got it up. I'm working on, on uh, testnet. I'm like, oh, awesome. all right, great. <laughs> You're like, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. And you guys just met on Discord? Is that, and like yeah. just decided, and he was like, oh yeah, you, you're you good. Like, let's just work on this. And then you guys are like, and just stumbled onto a hackathon and we're like, boop, boop, boop. And then just won. I mean, that's yeah, how like, it. Boop, boop, we just won. <laughs> <laughs> It's as easy as it goes, right? Yeah. Um, that's cool. Um, yeah, you know, we I mean, talked Archie, the. Go ahead. Uh, I just Archie. Archie really is an, an incredible innovator and an incredible thinker, and he, he's only nineteen years old, man. Like he's just a, he's a sophomore in college right now, and Dude. um, but I've never met anybody who has such a an entrepreneurial attitude, but also just can get things done, right? He doesn't. He's got such a perseverant personality where he he's able to overcome whatever obstacle that comes his way, and that's particularly true with with programming. I, it it blows me away the, the things that he can do um, technically. So I'm 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 really fortunate to have met him and to have the opportunity to work with him. I mean, that's like what's amazing about you know. I mean, I guess tech in general, but like this space specifically is that you're like, oh my god, these people are so brilliant. They're like, I'm 19 years yeah. old, and you're like, <laughs> like. Oh man, I where did I went wrong? I, <laughs> I, I was not I was not on top of it. I was yeah, not doing things like that at 19. Right. Um, and, I mean, you're obviously a young guy too. What are you are you in your 20s or 28, yeah. Yeah. So, um <laughs> yeah, just just has a way of making me feel inferior for my life decisions, but that's okay. Um I'm here and I'm talking to you and that's great. So, um okay, cool. So, I think we understand choice. We had talked a little bit about in, you know, on our uh, back and forth in the on Discord about regulation. And I think you wrote a paper on regulation that kind of like piqued my interest a couple months ago or a month ago when we start. And so and I was I was asking you a little bit about some of this like stuff that's going on in Congress and like how you see maybe Algorand possibly being considered a security or not and like the the different type of stuff that's being proposed i don't know do you have any opinion on what you're seeing out of congress and regulation with your like you have a law background and all that so i i thought maybe it'd be a good possible a good conversation that we could have about that yeah so the approach that i take to compliance is based on legal informatics so I'm trying to find ways to use information technology to improve that process, to make it more efficient and to automate it to the best that I can. You asked about Algorand as a security. Algorand is not a security. So yeah. I think one thing that I've seen at least recently in some of the stuff that we talked about is that some of this new legislation wants to differentiate between digital assets and digital asset securities. And I think that's really great, right? I think it's important to know is this a, a digital asset that isn't a security or is it a security and what what differentiates these two things so typically when i think about securities you think about things that represent an equity interest in a company right like a stock right well if i yeah. want to start a company and i say okay i'm going to have this equity in this company and i'm going to represent that with cryptocurrency then you have a security token right 
that's like what Exodus, way. like what Exodus is doing on the Algorand blockchain. They're so if they're the, tokenizing their they're tokenizing their stock, and yeah, um, that's, that's obviously that's very clearly a security. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So like the the law that regulates the Securities Act of 1933, and uh, seminal case is called SEC versus Howey. Um, and essentially what, what Howie says is that the test for a security is whether the profits from the transaction are coming solely from the efforts of others. And over time, courts have interpreted that in, in different ways. And I think it's important to codify that in the law, right? We want legislatures to be making that decision based on the information that they have available and public discourse on the topic. Mm -hmm. Um, so that it's not getting handled by by courts on, off on the bench, because that's when, when real problems happen. Right, right. So basically, it, it, it seems and so there's this idea, though, I, I see floating out is that if if in, um, if a, a, a cryptocurrency had an ICO, it should immediately be considered uh, security. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it appears that there was some sort of I, like ICO with, I mean, most I think most cryptocurrencies go through some initial sale on some level. Um, I believe that Algorand had a sale, um, but they did everything overseas in the very beginning where they had some offering for like $10 that they could, you could redeem after a year or something like that. And it seems like they were very careful to do everything where they did not make it available to the U S and, and all that. Do you know anything about that kind of, you know, like an ICO that's uh, uh, um, not in the United States, not available to the United States. Does that like, does that protect a project from, you know, possible uh, regulation or? So if you're going to have an ICO, then it's going to be much more susceptible to regulatory scrutiny. And that's because in large part, we've seen a lot of ICOs that um, are more vulnerable to fraud. Right. Uh, I think... Right. Generally, that it's really important to like get the get the word straight. So like people sort of throw these words around without uh, really thinking deeply about what they mean. And I think with ICO again, I, I define the ICO as something again when you're selling a an equity interest or a security token in a company. That's right. the situation when you have an ICO. Um, in terms of like. The syntax that, that I try to focus on, I, I like to stay away from those sort of like initial offerings. I think the big thing that Algorand did and that we're doing with ChoiceCoin now is, is focusing on decentralization. So most, so like the, for example, the, uh, the Washington, you know, DeFi, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, they've all come out and said like, look, Bitcoin, Ethereum, these assets are so decentralized that they're not securities. And, and that makes sense, right? You don't have like one person who's controlling the assets or profiting from the asset where people are investing in it and then gaining those profits from the efforts of others. They're, they're distributed across the entire world on these global networks. And that's right. true of Algorand, right? Like the yeah. algo supply is controlled in large part, or at least a large part of it is controlled by the Algorand Foundation, which is tasked with allocating that, uh, that asset in a way to generate and create sustaining value on the Algorand network. And that's the same right. model we're following with choice coin. So, you know, you, Think about there are things that are tied to uh, assets that make them more or less like a security. No other thing that Algorand does is it's all open source. So the whole purpose of securities laws is to protect investors, right? That's you go on Gary Gensler's Twitter. It's always protect investors, protect investors. And, and how do they do that? Well, the idea is that companies would get access to public markets in exchange for providing information. You read SEC reports, it's, it's a really awesome opportunity to learn about companies. Like you read Coinbase's S1, there's a letter from Brian Armstrong. You read, this is a brilliant guy who really understands the risks and benefits and drawbacks of the industry that he's in and has a vision for the future. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that what we're doing with ChoiceCoin, what we're doing with Algorand, it is open and transparent and people can see that. And that's another important part right. of it. We, we, you know, for choice, like we're not taking investors, like it's not an investment, it's a utility token. I think similarly with Algorand, it's not really so much an investment as much as it is a, a currency, right? The idea behind Algorand is to create this borderless economy and Algorand is what facilitates that creation. So these yeah, are- It's like a utility, it's a utility token, really. Right. Just like, like choice coin. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so, I mean, that's that's great. And so I guess the idea is between off. I mean, obviously, some of these ICOs are people getting together and making a like a, it's a cash grab. Right. And they're trying to get a lot of money to to fund a company theoretically in the, in the, in the best sense of it really. And so they, and then they, they create value with whatever their company is. Now, are you guys, are you, did you, are you guys, you guys aren't doing like a pre-sale or anything like that or no, no pre-sale, no ICO. Yep. No, none of that. Right. And then, uh, well, that's cool. So then do you have an idea? So it seems like with your understanding of, you know, the security law and it, it if it's decentralized, so if these projects are truly decentralized, like Algorand is, and a light, you know, and Gensler should know that. I mean, they ha he has a relationship, you know, the relationship with MIT and probably Silvio McCauley, as far as I know. And so he'd be aware of that. So if it's decentralized, then um, then it's not, it, it should have some, it, it should resemble some sense of equity in a company in order for it to be ever for it to hold up in the court to be a security. Is that the idea? I think that's the way it should be. I don't know that that's yeah. the way that it's going to come out, but I think that's right. the way that it should be. I think to be a security, it should be tied to an equity interest in the company. That's the whole right. point of the securities laws to protect investors and companies. So if your yeah. asset isn't tied to your equity in your company, then it's not a security. It's a digital right. asset. And then even in some of the most aggressive proposals I've seen from Congress that even I think it was I forget his name, um, but I think he's from Virginia, a Democrat from Virginia. Bayer. He was that Bayer, the proposal you sent me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think even in that, which seems pretty aggressive and regular, I mean, it was very kind of it was surprising in how well thought out I thought it was like I, I kind of had. Um, this opinion that there was a, a big information gap here, but this guy's clearly been working on this with some people and it, they, it kind of, it touches on a lot of the different things and it is a wide scope regulation proposal. I don't know how far along it is. I don't know if he has co-sponsors. I don't really know, but there was, I saw on Twitter a bit of a, a little, a lot of people were talking about it the other day. And, um, but even in that there's an avenue for de-securitization, it, it appears where I guess, they can label you a security, but then you can appeal it. These things always come up where people are worried that crypto is going to die. You know, they're going to regulate the hell out of it and it's going to, and a bunch of people's wealth is going to be destroyed and, you know, and, and stuff like that. But it seems to me that from what I'm hearing you say that to be a security, it needs to represent equity in a company. I mean, and that makes perfect sense. You would think that would fall on the end, that in the end, that's what it would be. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I also don't, so I, I mean, for the, the bear bill, I mean, the one thing I did like again was like differentiating between security assets and, and digital assets. And I think that's a good right. thing. I don't think that regulation is a threat to blockchain technology. I think it could help blockchain technology. Like we, there's a lot of fraud that happens on blockchain networks. And I don't think it's a bad thing that we put mechanisms in place to protect people who work in this industry and in this space right it's important that we get it right that we do it the right way but over time it's going to happen there's going to be regulation that attaches and it's important that companies do their best and do due diligence to ensure compliance with the law and i, I don't think that's a bad thing yeah do you have do you have an opinion on the xrp case what do you see there yeah i think so it i guess from the SEC side, like it, it, it's a little, little frustrating because it seems slightly like selective enforcement. Like, why did you go after XRP? From XRP right. side, like, okay, you know, Ripple is worth forty-three billion dollars. Why didn't you spend a million dollars to pay a lawyer to make sure that you were in compliance with the law? Right? Like, if he right. is now going after Ripple for one point three billion dollars, then they're worth. $43 billion, that's not really a huge percentage of their overall market capitalization. They have the money to pay the fine. They didn't do what they were supposed to do and pay a lawyer in the first place to make sure that they were doing their due diligence to ensure that they weren't a security asset. Like, right. Okay. It's not like it's, they're not killing Ripple, right? Ripple is still there. Um, yeah. I think it's a lesson to other comp companies that like, whenever you hit that point where you have a significant amount of capital and you want to allocate a good part of that to compliance and ethics. And that's a good thing. It's going to create a more professional network. It's going to add more value to what you're doing. And it's going to allow 
your company or your your assets just exceed overall because you're doing your work the way you should. And it's hard, right. it's easy, right? Like it's not easy to sit up at 10 o'clock at night and read about securities laws and stay up to date on this legislation. But I mean, that's what we have to do. It's a great opportunity to be on the edge in innovation and technology and to build a better world. Yeah. And I mean, I, I from my little understanding of the XRP case, one of the problems that they had is that they, when they did their initial offering, that they did offer it to US investors. And I feel like that's something that might be leaving them open to some of this, is that true or am I just reading a Reddit post and kind of taking it as the truth? You got to be careful with what you read on Reddit. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, if everyone's got an opinion on it. And I mean, yeah. if you're not paying a lawyer for it, then it really is worth what you're paying for it. Right. So like you got to, I think that's one thing because people want to talk about the stuff in the abstract, but like every case is different and you have to get into the facts of the individual case. Um, yeah. I don't think that the fact that they sold those to U.S. investors is particularly it's problematic. I mean, obviously if it's, it's happening inside the US, it's under the jurisdiction of the Exchange Commission, it makes it more likely that like there's gonna be problems. But at the right. same time, like had they just gone through the proper clearances to one, either validate that their asset was or wasn't a security. And then if they found out that it was a security, then just go through the registrations. Like there's all these laws that people are focusing on that are, that are sort of anti-innovation uh, or the think that's the narrative, but there's also laws that like help small businesses, right? Like the SEC has an entire uh, section devoted to helping small businesses. You have the Jobs Act and provides opportunity for regulation, crowdfunding and exemptions from the Securities Act so that small businesses can get access to capital, right? The laws yeah. go both ways. You just got to know how to use them. Right. Well, and that's why I wanted to talk to you about it because you clearly have a background in this and, um, and it's so easy to get caught up in this kind of narrative that every like the SEC is just definitely a bad guy and they just want to and, and that it's all um, a plot to save the banks, basically. Like and it, I think it's probably more complicated than that. I mean, obviously, there is some of that. I, I'm sure that the interest of, you know, the United States and the banking and they they have some influence. <laughs> but like I. Uh, but it it's more nuanced than that, as I think what I hear what you're saying, and that there's a lot that the SEC does that is good for investors and good for companies, and it keeps you know it allows people. And then you hear that in the crypto space, that's like, well, we want sensible regulation, so we actually know what we can do. And you know, if you have a framework, then you can operate a business a little more successfully. Unless you're if you're constantly looking over your shoulder about like, wait, is this going to be something? you know, that is going to violate and, you know, you're, you don't know exactly how to move forward. Right. It's about navigating that uncertainty and getting the clarity that you need from the regulators to do what you need to do to ensure that the investors are protected or that the people in your network are protected, the assets protected. And again, I think it adds value, right? Like I think SEC reports add a lot of value to companies, like being able to you know, go on Tesla's website and read whatever Elon Musk or whatever he hired someone to write for him. Like that's a representation of his mind and his capabilities and what he's thinking about the business. And that is going to inform non-speculative investments and well-reasoned investments. And the SEC does a great job of that. Like those are incredible assets to the United States generally. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's a good thing. Right. And so just Real quick, so just to, to kind of tie this up and just bring it back to Choice Coin. So if I'm if you're voting with Choice Coin, you're gonna obviously have to um, register, right? There's gonna have to be some sort of you're not gonna be able to because you could open up a bunch of different wallets and vote from different wallets and things like that, correct? Like, so how does that work? How do you prevent people from voting more than once? I feel like we should have probably talked about that. Yeah. So yeah. we. Were Put that mechanism in place given the specific application for voting so like we talked about la county vote we would create a mechanism that would validate that so like every person would register and that's where our post quantum security comes in, which is actually pretty cool so like we're we're using sha5 so like there's uh quantum computing is a whole nother area of security but it, yeah we're using a, a higher level cryptographic hash to protect the security of people's data and information and essentially we would correlate their personal data with uh, one address and then there would be one choice or LA choice or LA county choice allocated to that address to ensure that they only had the one um, address and that would do a lot to prevent voter fraud. 
Right. So if you tried to vote from a wallet that didn't have a registration, basically, then it would be it, it would be an invalid. What's that? You wouldn't have you wouldn't have the ability to do it at all, right? Like there's no because yeah. you wouldn't be able to get it unless the county gave it to you. So we would essentially give it to the county first, and then the county would have the ability to distribute it, and we could help with that process as well. Awesome, man. Well, this was this was really informative. I, I hope it was all right. I know I was a little all over the place, but like, uh, yeah, I hope it wasn't too boring or didn't ramble too much. But I, I do really appreciate the opportunity to come on here and talk about this stuff. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I think you know we should. Um, I should have it out by tomorrow. And um, yeah, I had a great time. I, I learned some stuff. I now I understand Choice Coin better, which is a good thing for me, and hopefully everybody watching understands better. And um, yeah, I'm excited about the project, getting you on Tiny Man and seeing seeing where this goes. See, I hope someday I get to vote using choice. That'd be cool. I hope so too. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, man. Thanks, dude. Bye-bye. All right. What did you guys think of that? Brian's a cool dude. I appreciated him coming on and, uh, you know, being patient with me as I try to figure all this out. You know what I mean? I think that Choice Coin is a very compelling project, and I think if it can scale, it's going to be really exciting. And we're going to do more of these interviews, folks. I'm going to get good at these eventually. So you guys watch out, all right? You guys watch out. And if you have any suggestions on who you think I should talk to and who I should reach out to to talk to, put it in the comments as well. Let's do more of these. All right, everybody. Hey, thank you for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe. And there we go. Do your homework.